All right. So the question that you asked is you don't practice. I think your mic might cow a little bit. Is it okay if you repeat that? Um yeah, I was just repeating what you had oh, asked. Right, yeah. Okay. That is, yeah. Why is it that Westerners don't understand the value of practice? Okay, so uh, basically to not understand the value of practice is actually to miss out on the entire point of the Four Noble Truths. Yeah, okay. And that our culture, um, let us say, is a victim's culture. Every child is raised as a victim. Every child is actually born as a victim. When someone is born, they can't feed themselves. They can't walk. They can't talk. They can't pick up an armor and swords or a gun and defend themselves or anything. And as the child grows up, they begin to play. And what mommy does is take the child's play away and says, Clean up your room, do your homework, do what you're told to do, go to school, etc. like that. And so in that regard, we remain victims to mommy, that she's the boss. And so our whole world is an as a up, down, uh, big dog, little dog, underdog. In fact, Fritz Pearls called it top dog and, and underdog. Okay. And every human being is born as an underdog and they want to become a top dog and they don't know how to do that. And so they yeah. make a huge number of mistakes in the sense of I'm a bully, I'm a top dog. No, mm -hmm. bullies are really a dog. I've got a lot of money. I've worked <laughs> hard. I'm an entrepreneur. Therefore, I'm a top dog. No, you're an underdog. A good example of that would be Elon Musk. Yeah, that's what I recently. Um, I was going to mention the problem arises when you're a victim to mommy is what if mommy doesn't have it all figured out? What if mommy doesn't have what? What if mommy doesn't have it all figured out? And what if mommy has her own? Uh, what do you mean, what if? Um, as in, no one's as perfect. In that's the only yeah. way that you're going to find a mommy. Well, yeah. <laughs> All the mommies are like that. Exactly. Why? Because enlightened women are unlikely to have babies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand that. <laughs> but enlightened women might also, I don't know, give give talks, give teachings, like as yourself. We we can still learn from them, can we not? Well, the whole point about it is is that if we're going to teach the Dhamma it's better to have an audience who can understand it. Correct, yeah. And children are not developed mentally enough to understand. This is why uh, children are given rules, precepts, commandments, yeah. jobs to do, keeping them in that one down position. And as they grow up, they grow up under all of the rules that they've been given their whole lives. Mm. Okay, so the rules become the boss. And that um, as we become adults, it's possible then for uh, a mind that's mature enough is to start recognizing that, wait a minute, all the stuff that I have learned is not correct. In other words, I've been lied to. There's a little joke about that. The, the mom was a vegan, vegetarian, and she was raising her kid that way, et cetera, like that. And then uh, uh, she took the kid for a play date, mm -hmm. and, her, and her playmate friend had chocolate, good, high-quality chocolate. <laughs> and this kid got some of that chocolate, and his response to that was, Mom! <laughs> Now they want chocolate. <laughs> You've been holding out on me. Yeah. Okay, so very few of the four-year-olds in the world come to the conclusion that mom's been holding out on us, or worse still, that they held out on mom to the point that mom never figured it out. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And that's basically was what happened is, is that we have an entire culture of the blind leading the blind. So then does it just come down to a lack of education in, in the Dharma? Actually, it wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word education. It would be, um, for instance, a language. If you're going to uh, learn Spanish, you're not going to learn Spanish by taking a high school class in Spanish. With Spain, that's how you learn You've Spanish. You've got to go to the Spanish culture. Yeah. It's immersion. You've got to have it uh, that way. So yeah. um, another one it would be is, is that the Dhamma is to be practiced. Yeah. Often and enough so that the Dhamma then becomes that Dhamma is to be lived. Baseline living, yeah. Okay, big, big change in life. Uh, and so, also the the other point is is that uh, no matter what religion that people are in, uh, the culture is Christian. But Islam has exactly the same trouble, and that is is that the people who are in a religion depend upon other authorities. Oh, yeah. Pre yeah. Preachers, Sunday school teachers, but mostly a daddy that doesn't exist, a sky daddy, and a Jesus that's been dead for 2,000 years. And they become the substitute of the surrogate authorities. And in fact, what that means is, is that the person then stays a victim the things that don't even exist. And we suck up to that. This mm -hmm. is, a, in fact, you've probably heard this a lot in Christianity, if you've been around it, I'm that saying, Jesus it. saves. Oh, yeah, yeah, all the time. Jesus <laughs> saves. You need Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, you're screwed. Um, but like you said, Jesus has been dead a long time. Um, we can only save ourselves. Um, this is back to the Four Noble Truths yeah. then, is that the second Noble Truth is so profound that most people miss it. Okay. Even though it's simple in the sense of the cause of suffering, the cause of dukkha, and by the way, let's redefine the word dukkha to be dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction, yeah. Now, dissatisfaction means that we don't like stuff hmm. and want something to be different. that all of Christianity is all wrapped up on God did it. Yeah. And yeah. in that regard, we stay victims to God. Yeah. We need his help. We need his mercy. We need Jesus as a savior, et cetera, like that. And basically that means to save us from our own dissatisfactions, our own disappointments. But the Buddha teaches that the second noble truth is our own actions, our own feelings, ignorantly. That in fact, if we think that it's God's fault, that's a huge ignorance right there. That all the dissatisfactions that anyone ever comes up with is self-made. Mm. Yeah. We were taught that and we believed it. We were victims to mommy and to the teachers and to grandpa and to Uncle Sam or whoever. And we're just uh, victims because we have been victimized by adult victims. We've been told we need permission to be OK whenever we want to be, when in reality we don't need any permission. We can give that permission ourselves. OK, I, did, I missed you. You said you need what to be OK? So we've been raised thinking that we need permission from someone else to be okay, like God, yes. our parents, um, when in reality is we can give that permission ourselves. Yes, we need permission. And um, that is, in fact, one of the ways of saying it is, is that there are three kinds of doubt. And okay. the first doubt is who can I get to help me out of the mess that I'm in? And sometimes it takes a long time. People can be practicing, even practicing Buddhism, but not practicing correctly because they still don't understand. They think that the guru, the teacher, uh, someone 
is going to help them if they can only show off enough to prove that they're a good student and then they'll get blessed. They'll be told, oh, you're a good boy and you know this and you know that, and then they'll feel good. They're seeking right? external Still validation. Victim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're wanting validation. Why? Because we don't know how to give it to ourselves. Exactly. And the reason for that is because we've never been around anybody who knows how to uh, teach one to validate themselves or better still to figure out that we don't even need validation. Yeah. What we really need is reality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this very moment and is all we need. The need for validation is not real. The mm. need for love, looking for love in all the wrong places is because we've been taught that we need to be loved. And we don't need to be loved. You're already okay without being loved. You're, you're alive now, you're breathing, you're, you're fine. <laughs> and I hear you saying a lot, if you're not breathing, they're even better. <laughs> yeah. You don't have worries anymore. <laughs> exactly so, because all the worries that are created are created by people who are breathing. Yeah. And so this is the way of recognizing that the second noble truth actually has a profound point to it. And that is, is that nobody's going to help you. Yeah. Gonna now, see. if a kid goes to a piano teacher after he's been practicing for a week, the piano teacher can hear his practice. Yeah. But the guru cannot look at the meditation hall and see what people have on their minds. It is it's actually up to every student to figure out that they've got to come out of their own ignorance. They've got to come out of their own greed. They've got to come out of their own ill will that nobody's going to help them. That's that level of doubt that we can, when we get over that level of doubt, now the second doubt sets in. Oh, okay. And what is that? Am I up to the task? Ah. Because we've been taken care of all of this time by someone else. We could get somebody else to uh, uh, confess for us, to take care of us, to feed us when we're hungry, etc., like that. And so we've been dependent. Now, when we figure out that nobody's going to help you clean up your mind, you're going to have to do that yourself. And so that's basically where we start with correct practices to practice cleaning up our act, to clean up our mind, to clean up our attitude, to clean up our feelings. Dhammadasa uses this analogy of the buffalo, you know, veering off to the side of the tracks, and then uh, you have to gently but effectively put your mind back on track so that you keep on the, the path, straight and narrow. Actually, that comes from Sutta number 19. Ah, I, well, I wasn't in aware. Ajima Nikaya, yes. Oh, the, uh, the story is, is that the cow herd, yeah. not, not a drover that's got 10,000 cattle going from uh, uh, Texas to uh, the railhead at um, uh, Dodge City or something, <laughs> but rather this cow herd is in the time of the Buddha. He's got, you know, half a dozen cows. Yeah. So he sets out from his house and he has to take those cows through a bit of a village mm -hmm. in order to get to the place where they can graze. Well, along this village are salespeople on their, you know, selling carrots and selling bhaji and uh, guptas and whatever. Other people have their laundry out. The kids are out playing. And so this cow herd has to keep his cows in check. If they start eating carrots, if they mess with the laundry, if they trample a kid, that the village may in fact take those cows away from that cow herd. So what he's, he does is he carries a stick, mm -hmm. a long walking stick. And when that cow tries to get something off that table, he's going to whack that cow. If the cow veers off the path, he's going to whack that cow. Now, when he gets those cows out to the pasture, they're going to graze. They're going to have their heads down chewing. Now the cow herd doesn't have to stand with the cows anymore. Mm -hmm. In fact, he can go and sit under a tree and kind of keep an eye on them. 
And so the Buddha uses this example of that in the sense that in the beginning practice, the mind is likely to wander into unwholesome thoughts, wander into somebody's laundry, start to steal some carrots off the table, trample a kid, whatever that we're doing in our minds, and we have to kind of whack it. Mm. And that we're going to whack it joyfully, and the Buddha has the phrase, Aha, I see you, Myra. I can see you. Joyfully, we whack that cow to keep it on the path. That's the way that we're going to practice, is to keep going that way. So, after we practice a while, we begin to get the confidence that we can do this. That also then introduces the third level of doubt. Okay. And the third level of doubt is, uh, basically it stated is the knowledge and vision of what is the method, what is the path, what is the way, and what is not. Because uh, all that you have been doing is not the way into uh, yeah. peace and contentment and joy. And so we're going to have to rely upon the method, the Eightfold Noble Path, to practice that. So the three levels of doubt is, who can I get to help me? Can I do it myself? And do I have the method that I need to do it with? Do I have the tools and the skills? Mm -hmm. And when we have all three of those, we're good to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think a lot of people's contentment with practice comes along on each one of those steps. Um, but I think at least in my experience, maybe the f doubt number three was the most prevalent because I would be constantly thinking about whether this is causing me dukkha, when in reality, if I'm thinking that, that is already dukkha. So then I should mm. just return to the moment and start focusing on my breath. Um, well, focus, actually, breath is part of reality. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this so very moment. Focusing on the body focusing on our feelings, focusing on our mental attitude, the mind state that we're in, and mm. focusing on the moment-by-moment -moment thoughts. So this, all four of those together, is what is referred to as the Satipatthana, okay. the four foundations of what we're going to be working with. Okay. Now, the four foundations of mindfulness, the Satipatthana, um, actually follows along with very, very ancient physics. Now, we okay. have a periodic table of elements now that's got 92 counting. But in the time of the Buddha, they had only four elements. Solid, liquid, gas or air, and fire. Basically, okay. you could say smoke yeah. Yeah. and fire. Okay, okay, so yeah. with with that four elements, that makes up everything. And as we deal with reality, the reality of the uh, existence has those same four elements. And that we've been looking for love in all the wrong places, which means looking for it on the outside. Mm -hmm. And when we begin to work on the inside, what that means then eventually is to tear down that boundary between what's on the inside and what's on the outside so that you merge with reality. Mm, okay. This is referred to as uh, at one moment or atonement, being in tune. There's a lot of different analogies for it. Uh, duality versus unity. Okay. okay, but the reality is, is that we are uh, we're looking for love on the outside because we've already broken that bond between uh, the individual person and the reality that he lives in. He's already living in a lie. What lie? The lie that mommies and daddies and teachers told him mm -hmm. about you being a victim lot. rather than being a champion of reality. So we all of our lives, we've been lying to ourselves, telling us ourselves the same old lies that we've been told. 
And we have to free ourselves from the lies that we've been told by seeing them. Aha, I see that yet more, more unwholesome thought. Aha, I see that lie that I have been told. And then we come back out of the lie into the reality is, is that everything's okay. Inside and outside. Everything's okay. Everything is fine. Not a worry in the world. There are no dangers. So the feeling then becomes the feeling of safe and secure, feeling of comfort, and that builds into the feeling of satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Now that satisfaction, the Pali word, by the way, is sukha. Sukha, okay. And yeah. sukha is exactly opposite of dukkha. Yeah. In fact, that's sure. what the Buddha was actually looking for. When he says dukkha, dukkha, naroda, what he's actually talking about is see the dukkha and to come out of it into a state of satisfaction, come out of your dissatisfaction and satisfaction, come in back into a state of sukha. And we practice that over and over and over again. And as we do, we gain confidence that I can do this. I'm a winner. <laughs> and I'm a winner now. Yeah. Okay. I'm the one who is in charge of the way I feel. Mommy's not in charge. The church is not in charge of the way that I feel. The heavens and hells that they're talking about is self-created. And I'm going to stop creating hell for myself and start creating paradise instead. That was, I think I watched the video either yesterday or the day before, but you gave the uh, example of uh, atheist and I, I think a uh, Christian arguing on the side of the road whether or not, and then the Buddhist person says, you're both in hell. <laughs> yes, yeah. hell, you're both in it. Uh -huh. Yeah, that, that was a good one. Because um, I was raised Catholic, but I, um, like, all of the wondrous talk about feeling saved and being at peace never really, like, not like it didn't sit right. It just didn't feel right you haven't earned it yet yeah exactly. you gotta really suck up to the big daddy <laughs> count your rosaries and then you'll be you gotta peace. do what you're told to do yeah you gotta be a good little boy so that you can get permission to be okay exactly and then immediately when i started practicing anapanasati i knew i was okay because i could feel it and i was telling myself it and it was like so um well life-changing really because liberating actually yeah yeah liberating that's exactly what it is yeah but you don't have those shackles you don't have those fetters you don't have those bosses yeah that, that we grew up thinking that the bosses were bosses because when we were really little kids we didn't have much choice about all the bosses around us yeah but now that we're adults we've got choices yeah we uh we make our own mental state now so yeah so this is the way that we practice that whole point about the second noble truth then is the answer to your original question okay was is that people don't think that they need practice that they need to suck up to something that's going to help them without them having to do the work themselves mm. two things i have on mind at a moment um I think people misunderstand how effortless the practice is. Like, you just, it's literally just a thought you repeat in your mind. It's so free and you can do it at any moment. And off, off the chain of that, um, I think people get wrapped up in their daily lives and think, oh, I'm too busy to practice right now. You know, I've got to think about work. I've got to think about all of the uh -huh. other things. Oh, my it mom died. Good. I can't practice. Oh, right. oh yeah. I'm sick. I can't practice. Oh, I've got to go to school. I can't practice. OK, all of those are the excuses yeah. to where you can go to school and on the way to school, you can practice. Yeah. Any moment. Uh, now, the yeah. practice in, in that regard can be referred to as the right noble effort. And as has been described, right noble effort is just the tiniest bit of effort that's needed in order to actually get the job done. Just enough to be okay, yeah. 
just enough, and yet we'll find a whole lot of people who are practicing meditation and they're not getting much benefit out of it, so they start to mm. work really hard. Yeah. Putting in way too much effort. Leading them to more dissatisfaction because they're not getting the results they want because <laughs> they think there's results to achieve. Well, they're not practicing the results yeah. that they want. Exactly. So they're yeah. expecting the comma machine to come waltz into the meditation hall after 10 or 20,000 hours and, and bless them and then they'll feel good. But they got to work. You got to practice, you know. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. If you're practicing correctly, you're actually practicing feeling good, practicing having a winner's attitude, mm -hmm. practicing relaxing the body, the process. knowing the body. The process is the end result. There is no uh, end to the practice because you just continue continue practicing. Right. However, um, let us say that the beginner, because the pr the effort is not familiar and he doesn't have oh, the skills, yeah. that there becomes a difference. In fact, I'll give you the three P's about that and okay. we'll refer to music as the uh, example. Okay. And that is in the beginning, when a child is practicing or learning to play the piano, he practices. Yeah. Even when he's in front of his teacher, he's still practicing. Now, if the teacher is good and gets him ready for his first recital, in his recital, he's still practicing, but he's beginning to perform. Okay. And as he gets good at it, he learns to perform. Okay. But eventually he gets so good at it that it's no longer practicing or performing the piano. He's playing the piano. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And so it becomes a joy. It becomes a play. It becomes, aha, I do see you, Duca. I do see you. <laughs> Delightful. Okay? And, and, yeah. and, and, it, and it becomes a game that we're playing, a very happy game, a joyful game. Reality becomes a toy to play with. <laughs> yeah, because that's what it was from the beginning, but we were so the last. In the beginning yeah. is practice, and we got to put yeah. a lot of effort into it. But as we get things rolling, the effort, uh, there's several skills that come into play. And one of the skills is that attitude change. Mm. That if you think you can't do it, it doesn't matter how much you struggle getting it done, you still feel like a failure. Mm. And so along the way, when we're practicing, we begin to change our attitude from being a loser practicing correctly into being a winner who's practicing correctly. And now it really gets easy to do. Mm. Um, another so video, right. Go ahead. Another video you were saying was uh, Buddha was a lion. So once you become that winner, you uh, start to embody the lion. I don't know where I'm going with this. Right. But yeah. You're not afraid of anything or anybody. <laughs> exactly. That you've got an attitude. <laughs> A lot of people will will look up to someone who has that winner smiler's attitude, and other people are put off by it. They mm. can't hardly stand the fact that somebody is okay when they don't feel okay. Mm. That happens so often, actually. Yeah. But you're OK already. Yeah, that's the amazing part is, is that what you're practicing is what's already real. Yeah. And even the reality if someone, is that you're, you're fine, you're all right. And even if someone's trying to rain on your parade, that's fine. I'm still going to be OK. They're going to cause their own unhappiness and I'm still going to be happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. But that takes practice to keep of doing course. that in the yeah. face of when they want you to be unhappy. They'll work oh, yeah. hard at trying to get you to be as unhappy as they are. They'll go to many extremes to do so, but keep practicing. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, it sounds like that you're on your way. I'm glad <laughs> to hear that you're you're making some progress. With just enough effort to keep me on path. <laughs> um. From my perspective from the very beginning was that um, this, I, I don't know what phrasing I should use, but this is like the antidote to 
what everyone is suffering with in Western society and everyone's complaining about it, but nobody, well, very little people know the solution to it. So like everyone complains about being addicted to their phones, suffering from screen time, addictions to all sorts of things like cigarettes, They're looking cannabis. for validation. They're looking yeah. for love. They're looking for entertainment. They're looking for something because they don't actually believe that they're already okay. They believe yeah. the lie that they've been told that you've got to work, you've got to perform, you've got to yeah. do what you're told to do. You got to suck up to the dude who's got the juice because you don't got none. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, after acknowledging that, I knew that all I needed to do was practice with just enough effort. And I feel like I made, I don't even know how to like talk about it, but. I just made the progress that I needed to at the right time to help me in specific scenarios, which showed me how real it was, which then doubled down on my um, understanding of how effective the practice was. And so mm -hmm. then after that, I knew that, okay, well, then I'm just going to continue practicing. That's, that's, yeah, that's all there is. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly correct. That's, in fact, profound when you see how valuable. Yeah. That Anapanasati practice is of great fruit. It's of <laughs> enormous value, which means let's keep doing it because yeah. we're getting such great satisfaction out of it. And then that satisfaction actually grows. Oh, yeah, it does. <laughs> and I feel like I'm maybe at the tip of the iceberg, but even then, I, I, uh, well, yeah, it, it grows. Um, yeah, I think so there's that saying like you can't give a, a loaf of bread to someone who's not ready for crumbs. But I think if more people were ready for Anapanasati, we could be living in a completely different world right now. And I know saying that is because uh, one time you said there's three worlds, the, the, the planet Earth, like the actual Earth, then there's uh -huh. your concept of the, the Earth like humanity, and then there's the 50 meter radius around you, right? And mm -hmm. I think all we can affect is the 50 meters around us, but if if more people were practicing Anapanasati and Dharma, everybody's 50 meter radius would be better. Um, in, and I think it's hard to predict what that would look like. Mm -hmm. But all I can do, rather than wishing it was, I can just practice and practice and practice and hopefully people see that and catch on, I guess. Yeah, right. And as that as you continue to practice, your joy continues to mm. build mm. almost as if your bucket is getting full. And when it does, it overflows. And then mm. you spread your joy to other people. Exactly. That, that in a way, I would say that the the plant Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa was kind of on to this back in the 1930s when he okay. said that we do not have to keep the actual teaching of the Buddha secret anymore. It's yeah. time to let the cat out of the bag. Wait, out of curiosity, was it secret in the, in the past? Oh, yeah, it oh. happened. It happened because of the uh, it, not actually originally, but even in the time of the Buddha, he had enemies. Ah, uh, well, yeah, I mean, I've heard about that. And now. by the 1400s, the, uh, the Brahmins and the Mughals, mm -hmm. the Ottomans, they actually destroyed Buddhism in India, killing something like a hundred million people. Yeah. Destroying the university, pulling up the Bodhi tree by its roots. They did everything they could to destroy it. Well, that dissatisfaction that they had well, to, to be That's the Islam it. for you. Yeah. But they didn't destroy it because a lot of people just put away the robes. Many others took their robe and their bowl and took a hike. <laughs> Many of them <laughs> to, to the Thailand, mountain. to Burma, to Sri Lanka, to uh, China, to Tibet. But in fact, um, it, it's kind of like this. Imagine <laughs> that you've got a whole handful of salt cheese. Okay. Okay, like... Uh, Oh, Swiss cheese or something like that. Okay, yeah, what yeah. happens when you squeeze it to get it really tight? 
it it's comes out all influence. over the place. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what happened with Buddhism. It just when they tried to murder it, it just went all over the place. But, but in that regard, they decided that it was dangerous to just let anybody know what their actual teaching of the Buddha was, because there's going to be those who don't like to hear that. Okay. The Christians yeah. hate Buddhism, not because they hate, I mean, they hate atheists because atheists want to argue with them. Christians, they don't even know the danger of Buddhism. And when they do, they really hate it because Buddhism just destroys Christianity. Yeah. Because yeah. reality always takes over the fables. And so Christians will actually hate and not want the teaching of the Buddha taught. But Christianity is on the decline now. It is, yeah. And many people are leaving it and they're still looking for something. Mm. And so Buddhism has a chance. If, they, if the people who are looking can actually find someone who understands the teaching of the Dhamma, the, the, the actual Buddha Dhamma will spread even, easily. Mm. Unfortunately, Western Buddhism has a lot of charlatans, crooks, and money grubbers who are trying to sell the Dhamma. High price retreats, retreat, high price yeah. books. Yeah. Right. So a lot of people are going to uh, Barnes and Noble and bookstores or Reddit to find the Buddha, and <laughs> and they're not going to find it there. No. Um, We're going to find it with good, noble friends. That's where we find the actual teaching of the Buddha. And Sanghas, if they're able to access them, and, and this one because of them. Um, are there other open Sangha foundations, or is this like the first online interpretation of Dharma, Buddha, Buddha Dharma? Like, well, I wouldn't say that. We're not unique in any particular way yeah. other than one thing, and that okay. is just that every website about Buddhism that you'll find is about our center, our Buddhism, our book, uh. our, our retreats. <laughs> <laughs> but without having an open invitation, there are also some places that have lists of places like uh, Dominet or Budanet and uh, uh, Goset and several of those. But ours, our website is highly interactive. Mm. That's what makes it unique is, is that it's high because we're there to help people find friends. Mm. Yeah. Find the Dhamma. Noble friends while practicing yeah yeah to help practice correctly to take the money out of it and put friendship in then in fact here's something really weird okay the west even england especially america is capitalistic oh yeah buddhism is socialistic <laughs> and they're happier <laughs> who would have thought yeah it's social <laughs> yeah it's Humans, a friendship base. They don't. There's no buying and selling. Everything is given away free. Mm. <laughs> Capitalists, they don't like that so much. Because they need to find a way to make money out of it. <laughs> you can't make any money off of yeah. it. That's why you can't make any money off of the teaching of the Buddha. It's priceless in a way. That's how it said. It's so priceless that it, you can't charge for it. It yeah. has to be given away freely. Yeah. But it I also was, has the quality of paying forward. It's not a payback. Right, you see, Western right. Buddhism is is um, uh, uh, going in the direction of capitalism, going into a business model, which means you you pay for what you get. Mm. But with the pay forward, which is actually the way that humans are built, in the sense that mommy and daddy doesn't expect the little kid to take care of uh, uh, them. They can take care of themselves. But when Johnny grows up, he's going to pay it back to his parents by raising his own kids. Mm -hmm. We pay it forward into the next generation. 
So that's what we're looking for. In fact, we're looking for people who learn the Dhamma well enough that they get inspired well enough that they, they're overflowing with it and then they pass it on to the next generation. I had another thing come to mind. When you used the example of squeezing the cream cheese, um, I thought about how each chunk of cheese between your fingers splits off and kind of like, it, so Buddhism would be less cohesive after they will spread out, right? I think some of the work you're doing is just returning back to its roots and also consolidating it into one big mass again, perhaps. That's how I interpret it. Um, well, actually, there's really nothing to it. How can you consolidate nothing? There's just exactly. nothing there. <laughs> no problems, um, no worries, no money, exactly. no uh, teacher guru, that everything is just friendly, friendship. And practice with noble friends. Yeah. Um, I think this school's been great. <laughs> I've had a great time. Um, yeah. Well, I know what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to take a peek into those books you recommended. I'm going to continue practicing and I'm going to continue watching and I'm going to continue attending Sangha calls. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we have Skype, yeah, we have yeah. Discord, and we have the website. And you can yeah. communicate, you can uh, send messages, you can join group, you can uh, hit the forum, you can uh, post. You can add comments. There's all kinds of ways to communicate with one another. And in mm -hmm. fact, I really like the messaging system because if somebody doesn't get their message within 24 hours, this website will actually send out an email. Oh, that's good. Yeah, nice. Nice little reminder. I like that. Um, yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm feeling content and happy and satisfied. <laughs> Excellent. I'm welcome aboard. Thank I'm glad you. to have you as a friend. Oh, glad to have you as a friend as well, Damarato. <laughs> it's been All such right. a pleasure and delight, not only on this call, but watching your videos. You know, you have such a unique blend of humor, wisdom, and intelligence that it's it's really inspiring. So, yeah. <laughs> just an old man. <laughs> You're just doing you. You're keeping me out. I'm keeping it real. <laughs> Right. Oh, nice. Okay. Well, let's finish this call now. Call me back in a week or so. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. You I'll, keep um, practicing. Do, do I need to book a call or can I just. Uh, no, send no, you just call okay. anytime. Amazing. Well, I'm going to keep practicing. Um, Excellent. Keep well, Damarato, and enjoy the weather. Have, have some fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll see you. See you, Damarato. Bye. Bye bye. Bye-bye.